Welcome to my ultimate cookery course, packed with cooking tips, information, and 100 recipes to stake your life on. Right now, it's all about making it easy. Making it easy for yourself in the kitchen means using the time you have effectively. And the one thing that can really help you do that is your freezer. My recipe for meatballs is so versatile, it can be used to make a dozen amazing dishes. One of my favorites is meatballs in fragrant coconut broth. Having a freezer of home-cooked delicious food ready to go can be a real lifesaver. It means you never have to compromise on flavor. These meatballs are delicious, but more importantly, they freeze so well. First off, get your pan on and start sweating off your onions and your garlic. This recipe involves making the meatballs in a classic way, but the exciting part is actually cook them in coconut milk. And it gives a really nice new dimension to a sort of soft, rich, sumptuous meatball. Chop the onion nice and finely, keeping those slices very close together. The closer the slices, the finer the onion. Pat it back down at an angle, slice down, and just chop. I want the onions nice and fine because I want some finesse to these meatballs. And the secret of a really good meatball is the texture, getting that balance right between the minced beef, the breadcrumbs, the milk, and the seasoning. A couple of cloves of garlic. Slice the garlic really nice and thinly. Nice. Pan, nice and hot, and a tablespoon of olive oil. Quite generous with the olive oil. Onions and garlic in. A little touch of salt and pepper. With your mince, open it up a little bit and sort of pat it out. Salt and pepper. For me, a good meatball is all about the, the softness, the texture of that rich beef and the way it sort of melts in your mouth. You can colour it on the outside, but you want it nice and soft and sort of rich in the centre. Mix that in beautifully and then paste it back out again. I've got some really nice dried chilli flakes. I'm going to season the onions with the chilli flakes. Chilli flakes in. Cook that out for two minutes. I'm going to add some milk. Take your breadcrumbs. Make a little well. Three or four tablespoons of milk. That makes a sort of nice, slightly doughy texture. But it lightens the texture of the meatball. Place that in. Add your onions, your garlic, and your chilli in there as well. Nice. Get your hands in there and start mixing them. If you've got the right amount of milk and breadcrumbs, it doesn't need binding with an egg. Don't make them too small. The problem with making them too small is the fact that they dry out quickly. Just the size of a golf ball. A little bit bigger. Nice. Give them a really nice tight squeeze. That stops it from breaking up. It always pays to double the recipe and spend a bit more time making extra meatballs so you can freeze a batch ready for another time. Give the pan a little wipe out. Don't wash out that pan. We've got that flavour from the onions and the garlic at the bottom. Get that pan nice and hot. A touch of olive oil in there. Place them at the top of your pan. Nice and gently sit them in the oil. Get a palette knife and go underneath them and just sort of tilt the pan and let the pan cook the back of the meatball. We're going to add some heat. Coriander seeds, slightly spicy and peppery, which will give a really nice flavour to the coconut milk. In. Next, some cardamom seeds. Three or four onto the board. Knife on. In. A little touch of turmeric into the centre of the pan. That's going to give it a really nice spicy flavour. A little pinch of cinnamon. All the time you're doing this, those meatballs are just getting tastier and tastier. A couple of dried chilies, let them infuse in that oil. And then some lemongrass. Just take the back of your knife and sort of beat it down. That starts to release all that lovely sort of fragrance. It's like someone's just let off the most amazing fragrant air freshener in with the lemongrass. And finally, some fresh ginger. Just peel and slice, nice and thinly. Time now to turn them over 
and let the other half for a wonderful flavour. Chicken stock. In. Bring the stock up to the boil. Turn the gas up and then add the coconut milk. And I want the coconut milk just sitting underneath the top of the meatball. Coconut milk in. And that sort of gives it that creamy richness, but it's not heavy. It's a fragrant, light richness. Before we start simmering, check the seasoning. Mm. That nice, soft texture of the meatball, but that fragrant, light richness of the coconut broth. It's going to cook those meatballs perfectly. Bring the broth up to the boil, then simmer gently for eight to ten minutes. Touch them with your finger. This should be slightly pliable, but slightly springy. Gas off. I'm going to finish it off with something light and fresh. Zest of lime. But I want the zest on top of the meatball. So I'll cut through that richness. And then finally, squeeze the fresh lime. And that just gives it that nice, zesty, amazing taste. Stir in the juice. Mmm. It's got that kick and that, that vibrant taste. Now, the exciting part. When you come to serve it, be generous with that coconut broth. Tilt the pan. Get a good couple of ladles of the broth in. Mm, meatballs. And that is a very delicious way of eating an old-fashioned meatball and bringing it into the 21st century. And they're just as good cooked from frozen as well. The secret to stress-free cooking is making it easy for yourself. Here are three more recipes, all based on my delicious, freezer-friendly meatballs. Just defrost them before you get started. First up, beef meatballs with arrochetti, kale and pine nuts. Add meatballs to hot oil and brown. Meanwhile, cook arrochetti pasta, then add chopped garlic to the meatballs. And shredded kale, a delicious green veg packed with vitamins which cooks in minutes. Cabbage is a great alternative if you can't get kale. Put in some of the cooking water from the pasta to steam through. When the pasta is cooked al dente, drain and add to the meatballs. Season, then finish with sweet buttery pine nuts and grated fresh parmesan cheese. Meatballs with arrochetti, kale and pine nuts. From meatballs to meal in minutes. My next easy standby supper is beef meatball sandwich with melting mozzarella and tomato salsa. Top a lightly toasted roll with pan fried meatballs. Then tear off chunks of creamy buffalo mozzarella, pile it on, and melt it under the grill. For the tangy salsa, slice sweet red onion, then add juicy diced tomatoes and roughly chopped fresh coriander. Season and drizzle with olive oil. Spoon over. Perfect in a flash. Beef meatball sandwich with melting mozzarella and a tomato salsa, a sandwich to die for. My final super easy meatball recipe is fiery meatball soup. Fry chopped onion and finely sliced garlic in hot olive oil. Add cumin seeds for warmth and add your meatballs. Cook on a high heat to get all those aromatic flavours out. Once the meatballs are browned, add hot chilli paste for a spicy kick. Tinned tomatoes, dried oregano and a litre of beef stock. Then simmer. Next, add sweet corn and chopped courgettes. To finish, 
add hot jalapeno peppers, chopped fresh coriander, and crushed tortilla chips. A one-pot meatball wonder that really packs a punch. Fiery meatball soup. One versatile meatball recipe, four deliciously different dishes, food that's certain to make your life in the kitchen easier and stress-free. Amazing. Whether you're making great food to freeze or to take straight to the table, you need to know how to shop for the best ingredients. Next up, my shopping guide to oils. It doesn't matter if you're baking, frying or dressing salads. Using the right oil can dramatically alter the taste and texture. Here are the most common oils and what to use them for. Sunflower oil is a good value all-rounder. Nice and light for frying, baking, in dressings and spicy dishes. Groundnut or peanut oil is great for cooking on high heat as it gets really hot without burning. Sesame oil, a flavoursome, sweet and nutty oil. Perfect sprinkled over Asian dishes before serving. Rapeseed oil is a healthier choice for using in salads. I love walnut oil. Fantastically fragrant, it's brilliant for salad dressings, and it gives cakes a distinctive flavour. But the oil I use most in my cooking is olive oil. To find some of the best olive oils sold in Britain, you have to go to one of the most unlikely places. An electrical shop in London's East End. Turkish-born Mehmet Morat has olive oil in his blood. My family's produced this olive oil for centuries. What he doesn't know about it isn't worth knowing. The very best extra virgin olive oil is first cold pressed. It's actually pressed by stone, and then it's put through a centrifugal spinner, which spins out all the bitter waters, and then you've got just pure olive oil, cold pressed olive oil, and you've got to taste it to believe it. Pour a little sample, slurp it, draw it in with air, don't swallow it, warm it in your mouth, coat the whole of the inside of your mouth with it, and then swallow. It will go down like fruit juice, and it will leave no greasiness or oiliness in your mouth whatsoever. Absolutely sensational. Beautiful. My favourite use of any olive oils is to pour it into a, a bowl, room temperature, rub some wild oregano into it, and get some fresh crusty bread and just dip it. It's food on its own. Don't need anything else. Welcome back to my ultimate cookery course. Next, on my guide to making it easy, I'll be creating a sweet treat to drool over. I want the chocolate, like little matchsticks, dotted around. But first, my quick guide to the basic kit you need to get cooking fantastic food. You don't need to spend a fortune on masses of kitchen equipment. Here are three more kitchen essentials. Whisk, spoon and spatula. These three items are so cheap, yet they are so important to great home cooking. A whisk. There's so much more control when you've got something whisking in your hand. You can gauge it so much better than you can if it's on an electric mixer. The bigger the balloon on your hand whisk, the faster it will whip as it draws in more air. Wooden spoons don't scratch pans and should be washed by hand. Spatulas are indispensable for baking or mixing. Make sure it's heat resistant so it doesn't melt. But more importantly, phenomenal for making omelets, great with scrambled eggs, and you waste nothing because the spatula almost cleans the bowl instantly. With these three, you'll be well on your way to cooking like a pro. And you'll need all three for my next recipe. My take on classic chocolate brownies is guaranteed to put a smile on anyone's face, and not just when they're fresh out of the oven. Blondies. Stock up on these delicious blondies. They'll keep for up to a week, and it's a great way of getting ahead if you're expecting guests round. First off, melt the butter for the mixture. We've had hundreds and hundreds of brownies. The sort of white chocolate version, i.e. blondies, are amazing. A little bit more subtle. Keep a little knob of butter for the end, just to grease your baking tray. Turn the gas down and gently melt that butter. Cast the sugar into the bowl. Just give that butter a little whisk. 
sort of makes the mixture a little bit lighter, slightly fluffy. Off with the gas. A pinch of salt in the sugar, then make a little well in the middle and sort of whisk. You can see it's already gone nice and blonde. Love it. Give that a really good mix. And the secret with the butter being slightly warm, sort of, it melts the sugar and nice and smooth. Lovely. A teaspoon of vanilla extract in. Next, lightly whisk in two whole eggs. Just give them a little beat. This is such a delicious recipe, yet yeah, so simple. Whisk in the eggs. Looking for that nice, sort of rich, textured, smooth paste. You can see why we call these blondes. Beautiful. Next, a teaspoon of baking powder. Baking powder in. Then half a teaspoon of baking soda. That aerates the mixture and gives it that little tartness. You'll see this sort of rise instantly the minute they hit the oven. And then your flour. Whisk with one hand and just slowly add half the flour first. Get that all mixed up. Make sure that mixture is really nice and smooth. Check it occasionally. No lumps. Half the flour in, and then the other half in. You'll feel it sort of almost go nice and firm. And that's why it's so important to add the flour in stages. It stops the mixture going lumpy. It should be just dropping off the whisk. Beautiful. Change over from a whisk to a spoon. Next, I want some texture, some nice sweet chewiness to the blondies. Dried cranberries. They bake beautifully, but it gives the blondie a really nice sort of chewy sweetness in the center. Next, my white chocolate. I'm not going to grate it. I'm going to chop it up. Just slice it like little bits of shrapnel. I want the chocolate like little matchsticks dotted around. Now, chocolate in. Lovely. Fold that in. I want a nice, even distribution of those wonderful dried cranberries. Don't over mix it. I don't want to break up that chocolate. A nice, even mix of cranberries and chocolate. You can see the chocolate. There'll be parts of the chocolate in the oven that will actually melt. It'll be like little pools of white melted chocolate in the centre. Now, baking tray. Small little knob of butter. I'm going to grease the baking tray and line it. Some greaseproof paper and just overextend it. Shiny side out, dull side hits the bottom of the tray. In. Greaseproof allows me to maximise on the white chocolate inside the mix. No greaseproof paper, the chocolate can melt and almost stick to the tray, so the paper is just a really nice insurance policy. Secondly, we want that rise and that sort of crispness. Now, with the mix, get your spatula. Go all the way round. I don't want to see anything left in that bowl. Position the bowl over your tray. Nice and carefully. Lovely. Don't leave that slice in the bowl. Nobody's licking that one. And then just take the back of the spatula, go into the corners, push, and come back into the middle. Turn the tray around. Let it work to your advantage. Try and get it evenly positioned in the tray. If it goes in even, it cooks evenly. Make sure you smooth out the top of the blondie with the back of the spatula. And then into the oven. It's going to rise, get nice and crisp. I want that soft gooiness in the centre. Bake your blondies at 180 degrees for 35 to 40 minutes. That smells incredible. Look at that crisp edge on the outside and that sort of soft, gooey centre. Leave that to cool down and it's going to sort of firm up and wrinkle, but it'll stay nice and gooey in the centre. Once it's cooled down, take it out and start slicing. Mouth-watering blondies, a fantastic easy treat to have on hand for yourself or to share. Next, my tricks of the trade and kitchen tips. 
To make your life easier, make sure you make the most of your freezer. My tip for amazing tuna carpaccio is to freeze it first, and it will slice beautifully. It's wise to save leftover wine for cooking. My tip is to freeze the remaining wine in freezer bags or ice cube trays. It's great in stocks and sauces. When you freeze soups or stews in tubs, the tip is not to overfill them. Leave room to expand in the container. A great tip for a cheap homemade ice cream, buy a high quality vanilla ice cream and make it your own by mixing in berries, chocolate, or my favorite, rum and boozy raisins. A fantastic tip for leftover lemons and limes is to cut them into wedges, freeze and use them like ice cubes. They won't water down your drink and they'll also add flavor. Follow my ultimate cookery course crammed with key lessons. Top tips and 100 recipes to stake your life on, and you'll literally be cooking yourself into a better chef. Many of these amazing recipes are on my app. Please check out the App Store for details. Go on, get cooking. Welcome to my ultimate cookery course. Packed with cooking tips, information, and 100 recipes to stake your life on. Right, now it's all about stress-free cooking. Cooking dishes in advance is a brilliant way of taking the stress out of cooking at home. And many dishes just get better and better with time. First up, my amazing sticky pork ribs. One of the secrets to great cooking is patience. Leaving dishes to marinate for one or two days helps to develop the flavor in your food and the end result is so much more delicious. It's a method I use in the restaurants all the time. First off, get your roasting tray. Put the tray on the gas. Pork ribs, 60% meat and 35, 40% fat. Give them a really good season. Salt and pepper. The nice thing about this cut, they stay incredibly moist when they're on the bone. And the longer you cook them, the more delicious they become. Let's push all that seasoning in to the pork. Olive oil in. Make sure that tray is nice and hot. And I really want that nice sort of caramelization taking place on the pork. And that's the nice thing about starting it on top of the stove. Use your roasting tray, get them colored, and then in the oven. Putting the ribs straight in the oven, you don't get the color. It looks sort of boiled as opposed to a nice caramelized rib. Ginger. You can't beat fresh ginger with sticky pork ribs. Place it down nice and firmly and slice. The thinner you slice the ginger, the more fragrant the ribs. Garlic. And it's really important, before you add anything to those ribs, make sure you've got the color in the ribs first. Don't rush it. Turn them over. That's what I want. That nice. Crispy colour. As they sort of braise in the oven, all that colour just turns into the most amazing flavour. Braising is just a chef's term for cooking something slowly in liquid. Right, ginger and garlic in. Spread it around on all those ribs to sort of roast the ginger and the garlic. Chili flakes. Chili flakes in. Next, Szechuan pepper. Citrusy, vibrant peppercorns. Incredible. In. Next, star anise. That gives it a really nice sort of aniseedy flavor, almost like you're roasting the ribs in fennel. In. Now we've got the heat, got the spice. I want to sweeten things up a little bit. Some fresh honey. Honey glazes the pork beautifully, counteracts against all that spice in there. But look what's happening. The color on the ribs is extraordinary. It's like a really nice chili, sweet caramel. Now, soy sauce. Brings that little bit of sort of saltiness to it. Really generous with the soy sauce. Japanese vinegar. Two tablespoons of vinegar in. Rice wine. It gives it that nice sort of um, tartness to the ribs. If you can't find rice wine, a dry sherry is a great substitute. 300 ml. That takes out the heat of that Szechuan pepper, those dry chili flakes. Make sure they're all laid down like a nice, tight box of matches. Bring that up to the boil. Cooking is all about learning to develop your own likes and dislikes. So always keep tasting to make sure you're happy with a combination of flavors. It's lacking a little touch of vinegar. 
Well, that sharpness. Now think what's going on. The tartness, the heat, the caramel, the colour on the ribs is amazing. I want a bit of a sort of oniony flavour. We'll put some spring onions in. Whilst these ribs are in the oven, the spring onions will sort of puree, but give a sharpness to the final taste of that pork. In with my spring onions. In with my stock, 400 ml of stock. This is just a simple chicken stock. The stock just sits underneath the ribs. It absorbs into the rib, and the top of the rib glazes underneath the rib. That gets crispy and rich, and that's what makes the ribs nice and moist. Really important. Into the oven. Mmm. Cook at 180 for 30 minutes. Then turn the ribs over and cook for a further 30 minutes. Now. Wow. They smell incredible. Each side has got that really nice, crispy, roasted edge. It becomes sticky and chewy and sweet, sour. The fat's disappeared and the pork just melts in your mouth. I want to take them to the next level. Gas back on. Now, shake the tray. And this is the sort of the way that we finish them in the restaurant. And for every minute they glaze in that tray, they just get to taste better and better. Now look at them. I'm so happy with those. Ribs done. Absolutely delicious now. But if you want, you can put them in the fridge and the flavour will keep developing. Then just reheat them when you want to serve. So, each rib has a nice slice of ginger on there. Wow, look at that. Delicious sticky ribs with an amazing marinade. To make my food the tastiest it can be, I always start with the best ingredients I can find. And the secret to getting the best is simple. Knowledge is crucial. The more you know about where your ingredients come from and how they're produced, the better. So, ask lots of questions and learn. When it comes to buying pork, you can't do any better than ask a butcher. And award-winning master butcher Danny Lidgate knows everything about the pig from trotter to tail. This family have been in the meat business for 150 years, so this man really is on the money. In comparison with other meats, pork's really good value. You get some really good cuts at really reasonable prices, and you can use everything from the tip of the trotter down to the cheek. We can see here we've got the leg. The leg is about this region, really lean, really good for things like gammons and hams. Coming down from the leg, we've got the loin, and that's where the pork chops come from. If you take the bones out, you can bone and roll it, and you end up with a really nice, easy to cook cylinder of meat, really easy to carve, carve like a loaf of bread. Coming away from the loin, we've got the belly, and you can see where the belly is made up of fatty parts and meaty parts. Don't be scared of the amount of fat that's on it. You need that fat to give, give the flavours coming through. Also, make sure you can possibly buy it with the skin on. The skin will crispen up nice and give you good crackling. Also, add flavour into the fat. Lower down from the bellies, we've got the shoulders. Really, the shoulders are a great meat. They're slightly fattier than the rest of the animal. You can see with this pork shoulder, the amount of marbling you get in the muscles, the interior marbling. Make sure you look for the marbling. It's essential for the flavour, and it's going to make a really good eating experience. With a pig, there really is nothing to waste. The trotters, even, are really good flavour because of their gelatinous qualities, and the meat can be really, really flavoursome. Also, there's pig's cheeks, which Obviously require a little bit more cooking because of the use they get, but the flavours you're going to get are going to be completely different to any other part of a pig. Pork is an incredibly versatile meat. They say the only part you can't eat is the oink. Here's my guide to getting the best out of familiar cuts. Smoked or unsmoked bacon is not just for breakfast. It's brilliant transforming salads, gives a real depth of flavour to stews, and is delicious in quick and easy pasta dishes. The leg joint, best known for ham, also makes an inexpensive, delicious Sunday roast and is great served with peas pudding. And the tenderloin fillet, incredibly lean, healthy and fast to cook. You can stuff it, cut it into scallops or strips that are perfect for Asian stir fries. 
A calm kitchen is an efficient and effective kitchen. The less stressed you are, the better the food you'll produce. So whenever you can, get ahead with your cooking. Here are three of my favorite recipes that can be made beforehand and whose flavor improves over time. First up, Moroccan lamb with sweet potato and raisin. This super simple, hassle-free recipe is cooked all in one pot. Start by browning chunks of lamb in hot olive oil. Color and remove. Then fry onions. Season. Add chopped garlic, ground ginger, and coriander. A teaspoon of whole cumin seeds, paprika, and fennel seeds. A cinnamon stick, bay leaf, and delicate strands of saffron. Then fry to release all the aromatic flavors. Next, add tomato puree, chunks of sweet potato, and the juicy browned lamb. For a sweet note, add plump raisins. Then cover with stock and simply leave to simmer for a couple of hours. Delicious eaten straight away, but over time, the flavors will develop and improve. When you're ready to serve, simply finish with fresh parsley. Minimal preparation and ready when you want it. Fantastic Moroccan lamb with sweet potato and raisin. My next super simple dish that just gets better and better with time is chili chicken with ginger and coriander. Start by chopping chicken thighs into pieces. Now on with the marinade. Chopped garlic, ginger, red chili, and lemon juice. In a pan, toast coriander and cumin seeds to release their flavors, grind, and add to the chicken. Then pour over plain yogurt. Add turmeric and season. Mix and leave to marinade from two hours to overnight. Next, fry chopped onions in olive oil. Then add chopped garlic and ginger, ground coriander, garam masala, and turmeric. Tomato puree and butter. Next, add the marinated chicken and all the remaining marinade and cook until tender. Finally, top with coriander. Marinated for flavor and cooked in 20 minutes. Chili chicken with ginger and coriander, a simple stress-free wonder. Having a delicious sauce on hand to serve with simply cooked fish or meat is a brilliant stress buster. My final recipe is sweet pepper sauce with grilled prawns. For the sauce, in hot olive oil, fry chopped garlic and diced bread. Then put them in a blender, add chopped tomatoes, blister the skin of red peppers under a hot grill, intensifying the flavor. Leave to cool, then they're easy to peel. Chop and add, blitz. Add smoked paprika, chili flakes, and roughly chopped almonds. A squeeze of lemon and a dash of sherry vinegar. Season, blitz again, and add olive oil. This sauce keeps really well in the fridge and will intensify in flavor. I love it with simple king prawns. Just add olive oil and griddle for two minutes on each side. Sweet pepper sauce with grilled prawns, simply delicious. Made in advance, ready when you want them, three stunning, simple recipes that take the stress out of the kitchen. Beautiful. This is my ultimate cookery course, 100 recipes to stake your life on. I'll be showing you an amazing spicy chutney that's brilliant for transforming the simplest of suppers. They don't actually smell much, but the flavor they give off is extraordinary. But first, five more of my 100 tips to make your home cooking easier. Kicking off with how to skin and debone a fish the hassle-free way. This is basically a filleted side of salmon. It's been taken off the bone and now skin off. Pick up your knife, a really nice, broad, flexible filleting knife. A little sharpen, lift up the base of the towel 
and then just nick a little bit at the end there. Twist the knife almost as if it's horizontally underneath the salmon. Pull the skin and you slice the salmon underneath and let the knife do the work. Now, get your skin, flip it back over and check you're not leaving too much salmon on top of the skin. Pull it back and nice and slowly get the skin, wrap it around your fingers, pull the salmon towards you and then just all the way through. Lay that down. One nicely skinned salmon, just like a perfect snake skin. Get your knife and just run the knife down and then with a pair of tweezers, these are fish tweezers, but you can use normal tweezers. Look for the head, up and pull. And with the skin being removed from underneath the salmon, the pin bones come out a lot easier. And the pin bones only go to just basically halfway along the fillet. One nice fillet of salmon, beautiful. There's still plenty of flavour in the trimmings from a filleted fish. My tip is don't waste those fish bones. Add to water, wine, a bay leaf and some chopped veg to make a simple but versatile fish stock at home the perfect base for a delicious fish soup. A great tip for intensely flavoured stress-free veg is to steam them in their own juices. Simply add to a pan with a knob of butter and seasoning, then cook on a low heat with a lid on to lock in the moisture. Crispy roast potatoes you can depend on. My tip is to parboil them, leave them to steam dry, then sprinkle them with semolina or flour and give them a good roughing up. This ensures they go really crispy in the oven. A great tip for browning meat or fish is to dry it with kitchen roll before you cook it. Then you'll get a much better color. Too much moisture makes the meat steam instead of sear and you'll lose that rich brown crust like the one I got on those sticky pork ribs. Another secret to taking the stress out of cooking is to anticipate the really busy times when you'll need things to hand that are already made. My next recipe can be kept on tap in the fridge for weeks on end and it's guaranteed to liven up any quick meal. Spicy chutney. With chutney standing by in the fridge, you can always add that special little touch to a simple supper. Prove that thinking ahead always pays off. Pan on to start toasting those spices. Keep the pan nice and low. Cumin, very aromatic, very fragrant, and it's almost like a light spice. Next, nice little coriander seeds. Coriander in. Now you're going to get a bit of heat in the chutney. Mustard seeds, a lot smaller than coriander seeds, but so much more powerful. Mustard seeds in. Now, curry leaves. They don't actually smell much dry, but the flavour they give off is extraordinary. Curry leaves in. Really important not to burn them, otherwise you'll have that bitter taste across the chutney. Keep the gas nice and low. The secret is sort of toasting them so it releases that oil and intensifies the spice. A touch of salt and then a couple of small, powerful chilies. Keep them whole. No one's going to eat them, but it gives that real nice burst of heat. Now, let them toast gently there. We're not going to chop the onion, we're going to grate it. Why? Because it sort of breaks down to a really nice puree in the chutney when you grate it. Hold the root in the palm of your hand and just push. Nice long grates. Want those nice long shards. Look, I've almost got a nice sort of onion puree, but it's nice and clear. A touch of olive oil. Spices, nicely toasted, onions in. Three nice cloves of garlic, lightly crushed them. Lay it nice and flat and just slice the garlic. Nice thin slices. Garlic in. Taking your time to get the onions caramelised beautifully will really reap rewards in the long run. Tamarind paste and sugar. In with the sugar first. Three nice tablespoons of sugar. That will give a really nice syrup effect 
a sort of nice, rich, syrupy texture to the chutney. Tamarind paste. You can get tamarind paste in most delis and the big supermarkets. It's a really nice thickening agent, but it gives that tartness to the chutney. And it's sort of rich, sugary, spicy. Next, in with my coconut. Add four nice tablespoons. That will give a nice body and a really nice texture to the chutney. Cook that coconut out. And now, add the carrot. Grated. The carrot just gives the chutney a really nice sort of crunch, but it also helps to sort of cool down the spice. Carrots in. The water comes out of the carrot, flavours the chutney beautifully, but gives that nice sort of vibrant, bright colour to it as well. And grating it almost sort of, it cooks instantly, but I want a bit of texture through here. Turn down the gas and just let that simmer for five minutes. If the carrots aren't that moist and juicy, then put a couple of tablespoons of water in there to help it along. Now, just cook that out for five minutes. Just as those carrots start going nice and soft, don't overcook them. You want that nice texture in there, slightly spicy, slightly sweet. Gas off. Keep those chilies in there for that. It's beautiful. It's nice and gooey, delicious, and ready to go in its jar as that sits in the fridge. It just gets better and better and better. I love to eat this chutney with cold meat or even cold fish, but with ham, it's amazing. It's a really nice way of livening up the ham. Just sort of roll it up. Get a nice spoon of chutney. I mean, it looks fantastic. Chutney onto the plate and serve. And that is a nice little gem in the fridge that is worth prepping in advance for. Follow my ultimate cookery course crammed with key lessons. Top tips and 100 recipes to stake your life on, and you'll literally be cooking yourself into a better chef. Many of these amazing recipes are on my app. Please check out the App Store for details. Go on, get cooking.